Hi, this is Jeff Klein, editor of Radiographics. And today I'm pleased to have with us Drs. Benjamin Kozak, Michael G., and Camilo Hymas from the Departments of Radiology at the Massachusetts General Hospital and Boston Children's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts, authors of one of our featured papers in the current March 2020 issue of Radiographics. Their paper is entitled, New MRI Techniques to Decrease Scan Times in Children. Doctors, welcome to one of our March 2020 author podcasts. Thanks for having us. Well, thanks for doing this. So, Michael, I'll, I'll go ahead and begin with you. Uh, your article begins with a discussion uh, regarding the long MR scan times uh, and the resultant need typically for sedation and anesthesia in infants and young children. Can you discuss this issue with us and, and how it led to this particular education exhibit and radiographics article? Sure, and uh, thanks again, Dr. Klein, for having us on. Um, you know, those of us uh, in pediatric radiology know that um, there's a, a particular age range in, um, in the pediatric population, typically between six months and six years of age, where um, many children have difficulty um, lying still and tolerating MRI. And so this is really the patient population that um, typically requires um, deep sedation or anesthesia to undergo MR. Uh, at the same time, in the past five years, there's been emerging data um, suggesting that there are potential um, neurologic consequences later in life associated with anesthetic medication exposure in young children. Um, the literature um, highlights uh, long exposures in patients under the age of three. So for those of us in pediatric radiology, it's important to try to um, minimize the amount of time that children are under anesthesia if sedation is needed. Um, in addition, many of the technological innovations that we described for decreasing scan times um, are also allowing uh, a number of young children to tolerate MRI without the need for anesthesia. So for both the sedated and the non-sedated um, pediatric population, um, the techniques that we described in this paper um, we think are very helpful. Terrific. So uh, Dr. Benjamin Kozak, let's go ahead and move to you if we can. Um, you begin this review uh, of commercially available techniques to reduce uh, scan time with parallel imaging. Can you explain how parallel imaging works and what the disadvantages are? And then we'll go ahead and show figure two, which I think illustrates the main drawback of this particular technique. Sure, thanks Dr. Klein. So MRI acquisition times are directly proportional to the number of phase encoding lines you acquire. So if you're able to acquire less phase encoding lines in case space, you can decrease scan time. The problem with that is by decreasing the number of phase encoding lines, you reduce your effective field of view, um, you reduce your ability to localize signals, you can get wraparound artifacts. So parallel imaging is an imaging strategy that attempts to reduce imaging times by reducing the number of phase encoding lines you acquire, but at the same time minimizing or eliminating this wraparound artifact. Um, it does so by using multi-channel phase array coils, which are essentially coils that use multiple independent receiver elements um, that have unique locations and sensitivity profiles. And you can use those unique sensitivity profiles to um, aid in signal localization, um, kind of offsetting the signal localization you lose when you reduce the number of phase encoding lines you acquire. And there's a number of different strategies to accomplish parallel imaging, some of which are based on eliminating aliasing in the imaging domain, some in the case-based domain. Um, all of them are essentially equivalent in terms of imaging reduction time and image quality. Um, the average acceleration you can get is on the order of 1.5 to 4 um, in current clinical practice. And you can combine parallel imaging with other um, techniques we discussed in the paper to achieve even faster imaging times. Um, parallel imaging can really be applied to um, really any pulse sequence, um, with the major disadvantage being you have a reduction in signal to noise ratio because you're acquiring less signal. Um, and I think figure two illustrates that, um, that illustrates that point. Great, thank you. Uh, so Ben, moving on to simultaneous multi-slice imaging or SMS, uh, this technique offers time savings proportional to the number of simultaneous slices that are obtained or the acceleration factor while preserving signal to noise ratio. Uh, radial rather than Cartesian case-based sampling uh, offers a time savings and a reduction in motion artifact. Can you explain how this works? And we'll go ahead and show figure seven, which illustrates how the sampling technique works, and figure eight, which shows a case example of an abdominal MR. 
Sure. Um, so with conventional MR imaging, um, we've historically used Cartesian case-based sampling in which you acquire case-based samples in a line-by-line -line fashion. In radial sampling, you actually acquire segments of case space uh, that are referred as blades that tra traverse through the center of case space, uh, which you can see in uh, diagram seven here. And um, by doing so, it has several effects, one of which is you oversample the center of case space and relatively undersample the periphery of case space, and that aids in turn, aids. Um, the preservation of signal noise ratio and enhances contrast resolution. It also helps minimize motion degradation of images by dispersing motion degradation along these blades um, of case space, rather than in a one coherent direction that you traditionally get in Cartesian sampling along the phase encoding direction. Um, so you get significant improvements in um, motion degradation um, for this patient population. Uh, in terms of time savings, there are a couple benefits for radial case space sampling. One is because you have the improvements in motion degradation, you won't necessarily have to repeat images that would otherwise be too degraded for clinical use. Um, you could even use radial case space sampling in a free breathing technique, uh, minimizing or eliminating the need for respiratory triggering. Um, in infants or other children with fast, shallow, regular breathing, using respiratory triggering can lead to long repetition times, which would lead to prolonged imaging. So by limiting respiratory triggering, you can decrease imaging times that way. Um, third, because you oversample central case space, you can actually employ perspective motion correction, again, minimizing motion degradation <laughs> and the need for uh, repeat imaging. And then if you're able to optimize blade width, the number and coordinates uh, repetition time with uh, patient's respiratory cycle, you can actually achieve decreases in um, imaging time that way as well. Um, the major, one, not major, but one disadvantage of radial space, radial sampling is that because you undersample relatively in peripheral case space, you can get some anatomical blurring. And um, that's really the major disadvantage we see it's also better to use radial case space sampling in the axial plane rather than sagittal domain planes or coronal planes because with the larger field of views in the sagittal and coronal planes, the um, undersampling of peripheral case space is a little bit more emphasized and you can get prominent streaks. So it's most useful in, um, in the axial plane. And then for image eight, which is displayed here, just pull that up real quick. You can see that in this, 12-year-old um, boy, um, these axial T2-weighted suppressed MR images of the upper abdomen. Um, in A, we used a radial case space acquisition compared to a Cartesian case space acquisition in B, both with respiratory triggering. You can see a significant uh, decrease in motion artifact in A compared to B. And then in terms of applications for radial sampling, um, it can be really used for a lot of different things. Um, and also in combination with other techniques that we discussed in the paper. Terrific, thanks so much. So Dr. Hymas, uh, let's turn to you. Uh, compressed sense reconstruction relies on the concepts of sparsity, incoherence, and iterative nonlinear reconstruction. Uh, it seems like this technique has been best demonstrated on radially acquired 3D gradient echo abdominal MRI sequences. Can you, uh, we have you discuss this particular technique and we'll take a look at figure 10 I think which shows a pretty dramatic example. Um, so compressed sensing reconstruction is actually a technique that's generalizable to many image acquisitions. Some sequences are better suited for this technique based on its inherent properties. As Dr. Klein says, it's based on the sparsity, the incoherence, and the iterative reconstruction. So the sparsity talks to an inherent property of K space that relates to its symmetry. So there is a natural redundancy in K-space such that there are certain thresholds that we need to acquire. But so long as we meet those thresholds, we can recover all of our information in the image space. The second part is the compressed sense reconstruction is based on undersampling. And the incoherence part of it speaks to how we want to do this undersampling. We want to do it in an incoherent way. If we were to undersample certain specific space, 
uh, part of case space, what would happen is we would end up with a hole that we may not be able to fill for image reconstruction. But if we undersample in an incoherent way, then the result is a diffuse noise. And that's where the third element comes in, which is the iterative reconstruction. So very well known and well established iterative methods can help you decrease the noise. So when you bundle these three um, in a series of events, you can actually substantially decrease your acquisition times while preserving image quality. So that's what figure 10 shows. Uh, figure 10 shows, 10A shows what an undersample image is when you force a reconstruction, assuming you have all the case space data, which is essentially useless. But what we see with B is if you work under the assumption that you did the three things that we mentioned before, you tell your reconstruction algorithm that you forcefully undersample in a certain way, and then you use denoising techniques with iterative reconstructions, then you actually recover most of your anatomic data. And then in terms of which sequences can be used or are very well suited for this, it is in general applicable to most sequences. However, some of them are really low hanging fruit. And those are sequences where you have a really pronounced contrast to noise ratio or your target is uh, really stands out from your background because then you have a lot of signal that you can um, use while preserving your anatomy. And the second one are dynamic acquisitions because the time domain of those acquisitions is highly compressible. Because as you can imagine, from acquisition to acquisition, only a few pixels in signal intensity are really varying, whereas the background anatomy of the image that uh, you're creating is the same. So those two are highly compressible and actually very well suited to be exploited with compressed sensing acquisitions. Uh, thank you, Camilo. Uh, you next discussed automated uh, MR protocol selection techniques that can reduce the duration of exams uh, by 20% and improve image quality. Uh, the article then discusses some investigative techniques, which include AI-based reconstruction, gradient-controlled aliasing, sampling, and reconstruction, 3D MR spectroscopy, uh, and prospective motion correction. Uh, let's focus on wave Kuiper, which has been focused on, in, particularly in brain imaging. Can you discuss this particular technique? And we'll show figure 14, which demonstrates the significant scan time savings that can be achieved uh, in a girl with a treated craniopharyngioma. So WaveKaipi, I would say, is the latest in a series of developments that have allowed us to accelerate imaging. Um, it's good that Ben discussed some of them before because we can build on those. So the first one is the simple concept of parallel imaging, which we discussed before. Something that's important to know is that the rate limiting step to how fast you can accelerate in parallel imaging is a function of how close you are to the individual receivers of your coil and to their configuration. And we sum that up in something called G factor. The higher you accelerate, the more you pay in G factor, which is signal loss, the farthest away from the coil. The second development that came about is the KIP part of the sequence, which stands for controlled aliasing in parallel imaging. So what that allowed us to do is that you can do parallel imaging in two directions. When you're doing a 3D acquisition, you're typically performing phase encoding in two directions. So you can do that, but as you imagine, you're paying twice the price in G factor because you're doing parallel imaging in two phase encoding directions. For the most part, many sequences, if you have enough signal and if you're willing to um, spend enough time, you can still make a 3D KIP sequence work very well. And there are several commercial advantages. The wave KIP version of this is the latest iteration of this, which tries to address the inherent challenge of the high G factor and how it escalates when you try to do parallel imaging in multiple planes. So what the wave does is you will continue to do the phase encoding parallel imaging in two directions, but instead of relying on a more traditional Cartesian approach while doing your two dimensional phase encoding, the gradients that you're playing here are played in a sinusoidal way, which is why they're called wave. So essentially what you end up with when you were to look at the case space sampling scheme is you'll end up with pathways that look like a corkscrew. And that may not be inherently uh, intuitive to a first approximation, but what that does is that it disperses the G factor, G factor penalty from just the center of the image where it becomes almost uninterpretable, it spreads it out evenly in a way that essentially takes away your G factor penalty. So the important thing to know is that what wave is, 
it's a very creative way to sample the case space that doesn't in and of itself lead to image acceleration. What it does is it removes your G factor penalty so that you can continue to accelerate to higher iPad factors in both dimensions while preserving image because you're getting rid of that really, really high G factor penalty noise that you get. Figure 13 and 14 show images of a treated craniopharyngioma, but what should stand out the most is the tremendous uh, gain in image uh, time. So figure 13a shows a 3D MP rate for a whole brain, which is a little over five minutes. But when you do high acceleration, you can bring that down to almost a minute while preserving your image quality. And image 14 shows the same for another sequence that we use very frequently in neuro-oncology, which is susceptibility-weighted images, where you essentially reduce your acquisition time uh, to a third of the time while preserving really high spatial resolution and tissue contrast. Terrific. Well, Drs. G, Kozak, and Hymas, I want to thank you for taking time today to discuss your paper on some of the new MR techniques that can be used to help reduce scan times in children, uh, again, which can be found in the current March 2020 issue of Radiographics. Doctors, thanks so much for your time today. Thank you.